I would say on paper, you know, the smart money is on the established, super powerful, uh, you know, frankly, 60 card deck that Jake Beard Beardsley has brought. This one's kind of tried and true. Whereas Luna's Phoenix deck, I really don't know what to expect. Um, how about you? Any any instincts? Well, a mold of five looks pretty tough over on Beardsley's side with Luna, despite having 68 cards in her deck, having the combo of turn one alter or turn two alter dementia, turn three lamplight phoenix pretty close to rolled up. Yeah, now is it as simple as you know, two drop, three drop, and I win? Or is does there do you does it require some amount of setup? Do you have to have something in the graveyard already? So I believe you do need a little bit of giddy up to get off the ground. That's to say you need some cards in graveyard to collect evidence for Lamplight Phoenix to at least start recurring it. But just having the two cards in play is a really sticky threat that isn't so bad to back up with a couple of copies of Counterspell we see hanging out in Luna's hand. Jake seems to be kind of tortured by his draw here. So he... Kept the one lander with Falaji Archaeologist ready to go if he was to hit a second one. Fetched a surveil land, didn't find uh, a second land, did find an ephemerate where if he had chosen to search for a white producing land, he'd be in much better shape. But everything just seems to be working out not quite the way he needs it to. Oh, God, Faithful Mending off the top. Not what the doctor ordered in this spot either. And, this, and it feels so bad. And you know, it's easy to say this hand does nothing, but it is just one card away in several different ways, it feels like. And Jake goes ahead and just goes ahead and slams grief, throws that lamplight phoenix into the discard pile. Yeah, he would have loved to wait until Ephemerate was available, but uh, just respecting the combo there and not wanting to lose on turn three, which I can't blame him. And this is almost one of those interesting spots that you kind of alluded to in the pre-show about counterspells against Beardsley's deck. How do you feel about Luna's ability to just pass with counterspell up versus having to crack this preordain? Certainly, she's earned herself that luxury um, through just getting out ahead uh, with, with a good start while, while Jake doesn't have a lot of flexibility. Like, he's missing that second land until now. He's missing the uh, creature set up in the graveyard. But... As we get deeper in the match, um, later into game one, and then, of course, the post-sideboard situations, we could see that pattern where Jake is able to pass with Gorio's Vengeance and try to um, put his opponent in a tough spot in terms of holding up mana for Counterspell. Sure, and this is a spot where, especially when Luna can just keep hitting these land drops, it's not that hard to hold up Counterspell, and all the cards in her hand are basically instants. Jake finds a Gristle Brand. If he can find a white source for the Faithful Mending, that can at least do something. Yep, and then to your point, all of his important plays are going to be at instant speed. Uh, Faithful Mending also is difficult to beat with Counterspells, since you can always flash it back if, if the first half doesn't work. Right, and this is a dynamic that we've kind of seen a couple of times when we've uh, gotten to sit in the booth together where it's pretty tough to figure out when you're supposed to spend your mana or not against a deck that can go off at instant speed like this. Ooh, breeding pool, not quite it, but not that bad with Leyline Binding in hand. Yeah, and just hitting those land drops in a game that's, that's really slowly... Uh paced out like this is not the worst. Speaking of land drops, planes off the top for Beardsley. That's a sight for sore eyes, but Luna finds the one ring to maybe recoup some cards. Is this the spot to be greedy and cast it? That is a fine question because that's the first proactive thing Luna has found to really drop the hammer and capitalize on Jake's bad start. However, we can see from our seat that if, if she taps out of counterspell mana, Jake is going to end of turn, discard Grizzlebrand, and then draw, you know, 14 cards with, with Oreo's Vengeance. So a lot can happen here, depending on the choice that Luna makes. Yeah, it's really tough, right? Like, at this point, when is Luna going to tap out? If not now, you know Jake has just probably unlocked a bunch of cards in his hand. Maybe she just feels like she her back's kind of against the wall as she casts the One Ring.
All right, Jake responds to the activation of the One Ring with Faithful Mending, so Luna doesn't get a chance to play a land after. Or at least not yet. Finds Tainted Indulgence to go with the Goryeo's Vengeance, still only one source of black mana. Ooh, that Tainted Indulgence may be a tough discard. It looks like he would have been right at five for it to just be that draw two, which isn't so bad in these sorts of matchups. But Luna bricked up the mana source. Oh my god, is this just going to happen? Yep, incoming 14 cards for Jake. He can also choose to ephemerate the Grizzle Brand, so it'll stick around. Notably, he can't connect in combat because Luna has both the protection from the One Ring and, uh, you know, Leyline Binding Solitude if, if she needs it. But, I mean, this is, this is what Jake needed to happen, going from five cards to, what, 19? And this is so tough because I don't think you can grief through the One Ring either, right? This has target opponent, not each opponent? I would guess so. I, I mean, I think we would have just seen grief get slammed there if it could have been. Yep, target opponent. Really interesting spot where Luna can even cast Solitude to try and deal with this Gristle Brand if Jake ephemerates it. But on the other hand, Jake found a subtlety. Jake probably keeping a careful watch on his remaining fetchable lands. You don't want to draw three quarters of your deck and then find you can't <laughs> can't get the land that you wanted. It's got to be one of the worst feelings. Down to four. So here's a question for you. I think against, you know, either of the decks that we brought, if Jake puts one of his creatures onto the battlefield, draws 14 cards, and the game goes on from there, we're almost never going to win that game. However, can Luna just brute force this like can can she untap and combo off and still win the game i mean, it's entirely possible there's even a degree where it might even be easier for her to do it because all of a sudden jake just has only 26 cards in deck instead of the normal 40 or 45 you would expect in this phase of the game and look at this we see solitude come down and exile gristle brand to give jake a little bit more life to play with okay that's cool yeah, it looks like he chose to respect Solitude and not go for the Ephemerate on that turn. So Luna's going to get to see a lot of new cards in the next turn or, or even two turns if, if we get that far. Um, looking for, I guess, just, just another Phoenix is the best thing that can happen. Florian revealed not quite it, but like you said, she's going to get to see a couple more with the One Ring. Prismatic ending in another One Ring? Not the worst. I mean, maybe this is the point where before we were kind of talking as if Jake getting to draw all of these cards was going to be the be-all end-all, but we saw Jake just have to pass the turn again after that. Maybe just chaining copies of the One Ring in perpetuity is the path forward for Jake. Right. Or for so Luna, rather. Let's let's ask this question. Spot Jake his combo and all the cards that he wants. What is his goal? What what's the best thing that he can accomplish in a turn? Because he can't deal 20 damage, right? Right. It's really interesting because normally the the go-to answer in that spot is to say, oh, well, you draw 10 cards or something like that, and then grief your opponent a bunch, but you also can't do that through the one. And it looks like Jake didn't find another copy of Gorio's Vengeance on those Gristle Brand cards either. This is this is tough. So he can grief, and then Luna can choose whether or not to counterspell it. Um, seems like you you probably would, unless you're saving your mana for something else, like access to Dead Gone or Leyline Binding. Uh, but that could be a valid a valid choice as well. Right, when there's only one copy of Counterspell in hand, it's really hard to not justify firing it off here, if anything, just to conceal information. 
So it's way worse if Jake sees your hand and then doesn't take the counter spell. You just don't want to give your opponent the choice to do something better for them. Oh, interesting. And here, rather than try and fight into double solitude, we see Jake just let the grief die with the ephemerate, now going to ephemerate the Falaji archaeologist, which Luna Litska. So what do you think Jake's digging for here? Is it just Gorio's Vengeance, or is there something else? I think Gorio's Vengeance would be the best. Um, otherwise, additional copies of Ephemerate. Uh, and he does find Gorio's right at the buzzer here. So uh, we, we circle back to that that big question, which is, okay, you can combo off, and then what? Then what does he, what does he want to do? Just find more copies of Grief or set up for to do the same thing all over again the following turn. Right. One of the things that it feels like Jake's combo is would make him feel a bit favored in the matchup is that it is so much faster. You are able to just do it on turn two. You do have these sort of grief, quote unquote, scam draws. But now that the game has gone on for a long time, it really just feels like pound for pound, Luna's cards are stronger. <laughs> Honorog posed a question in the chat. Is there any world where you can mill Jake out without the combo. Uh, like Luna gets has access to a lot of cards. You can evoke the solitudes and then sack them to the altar. So is there any way you could just piecemeal like, you know, 15, 17, 20 cards? I believe it. At this point, we're staring at eight that Luna could go after Jake's library for, right? Between the solitudes, the shaman token, and this table is eventually going to transform, assuming the game goes long enough. The Enforce of Negation, normally a great pickup. A little tough when a creature is the combo piece that Luna's digging for here. <laughs> and then a funny dynamic here is in a game where both players have been able to draw 20 plus cards, you know, the one ring against Grizzlebrand and Atraxa, I actually don't mind the position of the 68 card deck. Like, hey, I have more, <laughs> I have more removal in my hand than you have threats in your entire library. Right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. This, you know, I'm really interested to get your take on how sideboarding is going to go here. But for now, things look pretty great. Okay, so Luna did not there sacrifice the solitude uh, with, the, with the evoke on the stack. Okay. Here's the fable. I would expect the one ring to get activated in response, but it looks like she's just Luna is looking into sequencing the Florian revealed among other things first. Yep, sharp play that you pointed out there. You draw the cards with the one ring to get some more information, some more options for what to discard. Yeah, gone, not looking like it's it anymore. Luna really just trying to find another copy of Lamplight Phoenix. And this is the downside of playing 68 cards, is you are just a bit less likely to find those combo pieces whenever you're ready to close the game out. Yeah, so in theory, we could be one Lamplight Phoenix away from, from the game being over. We see that Jake has uh, subtlety. So Luna would either need to, well, I guess there's a there's a lot of ways you could do it. Like you could play this, you could play a Phoenix, have it wind up on the top of your library, draw it again, cast it again. Uh, so subtlety is not a permanent solution, but um, Jake is not defenseless. I guess is the point. Yeah, not to uh, spoil something that could come up in our match too hard, but one of the funny things I found is some of the times where you cast, say, a cheap creature, and then they subtlety it, and you activate the one ring to immediately draw it again. Right. And then cast it in the same turn. And here's another copy of the One Ring that Jake is more or less forced to force of negation. No. You know what? The pun's intended. Pun's intended. <laughs> I think Jake identified the same thing we were just mentioning, which is that uh, the subtlety is not going to be an effective answer to the Phoenix. So 
from you know just just a bird's eye view it's like oh why did you you know why do you get rid of your subtlety when, when you're so scared of lamplight phoenix and the answer is well it's not enough lamplight phoenix if luna does find that and there's even a degree where jake just really needs to do what he can to kill luna at this point and doesn't have very many ways to deal combat damage left in his deck. And this is the spot that probably doesn't feel so hot if you're in Jake's seat, where we see him having to start it using removal spells on things like Altar of Dementia, which is almost just admitting, okay, I, I can't do anything that matters right here. How do I actually stop myself from dying? And this deck is much worse defensively than offensively. I'm ready to be surprised, but it, it kind of looks to me like Jake is just out of material. Um, Luna has still Leyline Binding, Solitude, uh, can mill Jake for a few extra points if needed, and yeah, I mean, just how do you get those last 10 points of damage through that wall of removal? Yeah, I'm fairly interested to see how Jake ends up using these Touch the Spirit realms. There's something that generally you're used to just blink your own evoke creatures and get more value that way, but it could theoretically break up the combo even through Teferi Time Raveler, which I think is almost just a, like a life gain spell and then it makes you lose less, but... The first step to winning is not losing, I guess. True enough. And now we might actually see Luna assemble a combo where she can just use Teferi Time Ravelers to use the One Ring over and over and over. Yeah, and it only takes a few more turns of protection before jake is is going to be totally locked out of the game right and we're also about to see reflection of kiki jiki with these evoke creatures and altar of dementia this is one where luna really feels like she has her bases covered and i i just want to go back to that turn where she tapped out of counterspell and we even thought, oh, what are, what are you going to do without Counterspell up? But we've seen just how important that protection from the One Ring is on, against an all-in combo deck like this. Totally. It's been really impressive to see. And now, if you're a Jakesy, I think you're almost just burning the clock. Meaning you wouldn't be surprised if Jake decided I, to concede I, and say... Right, it. yeah, sorry. That was, that was not a good articulation. Uh, I, I am not quite sure what Jake's path to victory is from here. Is there a sort of 1% out that you can maybe find for Jake, even knowing that the Solitude and Leyline Binding are in hand? I'm tempted to say knowing the Solitude and Leyline Binding makes it impossible. Uh, I mean, Jake can always use wishful thinking that, that maybe Luna has, has a bad hand here. Um, and you never blame someone for playing it out in totally. a competition like this, but I, I'm, I'm not seeing it myself. I mean, there is the degree where he does have enough lands on the battlefield that he's not that far away from just hard casting any copies of Gristlebrand or Atraxa that are still in his deck. Wow, that's a good point. Eagles of the North. Is it time? <laughs> <laughs> And no, Luna's not going to let this one slip away from her for the memes. She goes ahead and prismatic endings on the Touch the Spirit realm, gets back Fable, casts another copy of the One Ring. A hundred cards in hand. All right, flashback faithful mending 
discarding phalange archaeologists polluted delta on jake's side still as glorious vengeance ephemerate It feels like if anything's going to be enough, Goryeo's Vengeance plus Ephemerate has to be pretty close. Okay. Goes ahead. Tainted Indulgence, a second Goryeo's Vengeance in Solitude. Jake with only four cards left in deck. So that that almost has to be it, right? Like, Luna can just play another creature and activate the altar. Well, the altar, would... the altar that was in play is gone, but but she has one in hand. Right, she's seen so many cards that even without the Phoenix, and now that there's such a fairy time raveler in play, Jake won't really get a chance to cons or excuse me to respond here. Uh, and finally, once it is way beyond being necessary, the combo is assembled. <laughs> I wonder if she decks herself for camera. Nope. All right. Jake says, let's pack it in. Let's move to the next one. And that was a that was a really long game. There was just a lot that went on there. That used almost half of Jake's clock and a little under a third or a little over a third of Luna's. Yeah, really good position for Luna getting that game one, kind of showcasing the power of her deck for a long game. Uh, Jake has to win now two sideboarded games with uh, you know a limited amount of time on his clock. So looking uh, at least for starter is pretty good for Luna. Right, we see really quickly Solitudes hit Jake's sideboard. How how much do you think this this dynamic actually changes moving into the post board games? Is Jake trying to take a slower posture, still just be kind of? you know, pedal to the metal. Um, what do you think? I think structurally it won't change that much. The players get to fine tune and perfect their answers to one another's combo. Uh, seeing the way that game played out, I, I, I don't think Jake wants to play a long game. Um, you know, if things get far enough away from him, then he can combo off and still lose like we saw happen in game one. So I would be... I would feel at least some sense of urgency if I was Jake, where it's like, okay, I want to have that grief ephemerate draw, get a quick combo, and, and uh, be, be very far ahead in resources where I can snowball that. Um, it does help that that he has access to an additional copy of Force of Negation against the one ring, and I, I'm a little surprised he, he's not reaching for the, the full number. Um, but yeah, that, that seems to be a, a big card for the games that go along. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Do you think, and you had mentioned that Luna was a bit lucky to get the first game. Do you think that it was really bad for her game one and it gets good for her post board? Do you think it's more just gaining a little ground for it to be 50-50? Who, who do, you, do you like in the post board games? Boy, it's a great question. And I, I even have a hard time speculating because that was just the first game of, of this matchup that I've ever seen. Um, so the, you know, the, the sample of, of one here, uh, but I think it's probably gets a little, well, relatively speaking, I think Luna would improve more after sideboarding because her graveyard hate is so potent against Jake. Whereas, uh, you know, Jake can, can fight Luna's combo, but that, as we saw in game one, that's not really the only thing that she has going on. Um, so yeah, I like her position moving to the sideboarded games and we just have to see, you know, the wide range of ways that this might play out. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. And it looks like Luna has a way to get a land and a couple of reactive spells in her opening hand. And Jake has to fairy time raveler and a couple of Falashi archeologists. And we got a couple keeps of the game in our hands. Looking good. So, uh, catching up on the chat, if you are just tuning in to Mako Masters, this is an ongoing league where there's a special rule that the players cannot repeat decks from previous uh, leagues. So, so actually, Carmen, you and I both in our first um, in our first night of play brought Yogmoth. And that was great. You know, we both advanced to the winner's bracket, but that's it. We cannot reach for, for Yawgmoth. We can't go back to that well for the rest of the season. And that makes it pretty interesting. Um, and, and Jake, who's famous for the Rakdos Evoke deck, 
chose to use that in his first uh, week now now has to go to something different. Yeah, and this week I think we even see a lot of people kind of bringing their pet decks, some stuff that they aren't quite as sure in, or maybe isn't quite as home. Like I know I brought my mono black deck. You had mentioned that you like the Junt cards a lot, but brought Expressive Iteration this week. We see this cool brand new flavor of deck from Luna and Jake doing something a little bit different. It almost feels like we all kind of went, ah, you know, I got one to give. Let's do something cool and fun this week. Yeah, which I think that's a cool and fun aspect of of the uh, the structure of this event. To be honest, you know, it's, the goal is to incentivize a wide variety and some spicy decks, and we're getting it. Yeah, I really, really love that side of things. And looking into this game, we see just players can tripping and setting up a lot. This is not the blistering fast game that we had maybe thought we were going to be getting going into the sideboard or in the post sport games. A bunch of counter spells and reactive spells in both players' hands, but Fairy Time Raveler coming down on Jake's side is really going to hurt the Dovin's vetoes of the world. Oh, great point. So a card that was basically went unused in, in game number one, Leyline Binding, is now actually a point of contention with Jake using Force of Negation to counter Binding and protect his Teferi. Yeah, and this Teferi is just worth so many resources at this point, especially when you can target your own creatures like Falaji Archaeologist. Yep, there you, you set us up perfectly. Bounce the Archaeologist for maximum value. That's just like one of the most fun. I know you are also a legacy elves enjoyer, but the Wirewood Symbiote Elvish Visionary stuff oh, is just so not good. a oh it's so simple. You just all that work to draw one card, but gosh, you have drawn it and it feels great. <laughs> and back to Luna's side. Are we gonna see a fair fable, a fair lamplight phoenix, maybe? This is looking dicey all of a sudden. Yeah, the Fair Fable looks a tiny bit better after uh, Teferi go went from five to, down to two loyalty. At least there's the hope that your uh, your Goblin Shaman will stick around for a turn. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of merit to Luna just playing the Phoenix here as well. Just It does threaten to actually kill the Teferi the following turn, and I'd expect Jick to be a bit lower on removal in the post-board games. So this prismatic ending that he has is likely a bit unfortunate for Luna, but I, I see where she's coming from. Yeah, totally. I, I mean, the first thing you pointed out when we went to sideboarding was Jake taking out those solitudes. So if, if those are out of the picture, then there are a lot fewer cards that can just deal with the 3-3 three, three flying. Ooh, Falaji Archaeologist coming to give Luna the business. <laughs> Gotta get those 20 life points somehow. Listen, we saw last game, Jake did not get very many opportunities to deal damage. Gotta get in while the getting's good. Ooh, copy of Ephemerate. Really just gonna draw his whole deck with this copy of Falaji Archaeologist at this rate. Yeah, so we're going on uh, 9, 12 cards seen with Archaeologist. He could just find more Ephemerates to keep the train rolling, but this actually might get the game done... Nice and quickly, which is great news for Jake because he wants to both equalize the game count and make sure he has enough time to wait to, to play game three. Yeah, finds that Gorio's Vengeance off Falaji Archaeologist can't take it fast enough. Puts Atraxa onto the battlefield. It's a copy of Touch the Spirit Realm, so I imagine Atraxa is going to unify even more of the cards in Jake's hand. Or Library into hand? This pun's falling apart. All right, ephemerates it. Jake with so many cards in hand, they're falling off the screen. All right, and Luna says, let's hit game three. Yep, makes a lot of sense. It's uh, kind of, you see the writing on the wall when when the player starts blinking at Atraxas. It's like, okay, I'm not technically dead, but my hand's going to get shredded, and 
would kind of take something going horribly wrong from Jake's perspective for me to even have a chance of getting back in. And that game really highlighted one of the one of the weaknesses of the way that Luna has postured her deck in the, for these post board games is so many of these cards are reactive and only play on the opponent's turn that not having any respect for Teferi Time Raveler can just spell doom a good chunk of the time. Yep. Yeah. So if it sneaks in past the counter spell and veto and subtlety. Then it turns off such a large portion of Luna's deck. There's the uh, the classic matchup of Teferi Time Raveler beating Veil of Summer, which is one that that, that could potentially come up. Um, but yeah, that was. I mean, Jake kind of just got the Teferi down and never never took his foot off the gas, and and that was pretty dominant showing. Right, that's a really tough one, especially when even a lot of the other cards. Right, there are six counter spells, nine if you count Subtlety, as well as these Solitudes, these Turn the Earth these Veil of Summers like you talked about. And there's this push and pull with a bunch of three mana sor virtual sorceries in Luna's deck where she really wants to be able to develop those but does need to respect to fairy. So I'm interested to see how that goes in this third game. Luna's hand is... You know, unexciting, but might just choose to keep on the strength of uh, Fable on, on turn three on the play. Jake's hand, on the other hand, is uh, it is imperfect. He had double grief, but not much else going on. He he, And he's down to five cards for the second time in the match. Yeah, and look, he put a bunch of spells back, really showing uh, an emphasis on land drops in these post-board games, wanting to make sure that he's able to be able to keep developing threats, double spelling as we move into the mid-game and so on. Hey, Carmen, can you talk to us about Surgical Extraction? That's a card that maybe I would have um, expected from Luna's side against Jake, but what, what's Jake's goal with the Surgical here? So there are a couple of things going on. There's naturally the graveyard-centric combo in Lamplight Phoenix, where you can either break up that combo whenever Altar of Dementia or something to that effect starts to try and go for it, actually end the game and kill Jake. On the other hand, it also... On Jake's side, he has a deck that plays a bunch of cards like Faithful Mending that are able to just loot this away, or Grief that can just make use of the cardboard. I know there's the old adage of pitches to force kind of being a meme, but realistically it is better than some of the just creature spot removal spells like Solitude that Jake might otherwise have access to. Okay, I like your point of a kind of situational you know, high potential card being appealing for, for Jake's deck, which can see so many cards looted away, pitch it to grief. That, that makes a lot of sense. And it looks like Luna has the turn three to fairy of her own, which is pretty good against the surgical from Jake. But it does give win a window for Jake to resolve his own copy of Teferi if he wants. Yeah, so you see there, Jake, uh, what was it, a Surveil land was able to bin the Atraxa. So if he had Gorio's Vengeance, it would resolve right now. But he doesn't, so that means the game is going to continue and get a, a little scrappy. Now both players with Teferi on the battlefield. Who do you see this as favoring? I actually like Luna's side, just with us getting all the information in the world, right? where Luna just actually has a bunch of real material in hand to be able to pressure the opposing Teferi. Jake is really hoping to find something strong off the top, and don't get me wrong, if he finds a copy of something like Gorio's Vengeance, he probably wins the game on the spot. But unless he can find exactly that card, he looks a little bit behind here. Yep, looks like the best he can do is either prismatic ending the goblin shaman or just you know phantom monster <laughs> with the subtlety here on the main phase Ooh, that one cannot feel good but maybe it's what the doctor ordered it really depends after that last game if i'm in jake's seat i really think i just want to use a removal spell on this goblin shaman even if it doesn't feel good but i i think there's merit to just playing subtlety here what do you think Yeah, uh, it it looks like it will work out badly if that's what Jake decides because Luna could just hit a fifth land and, and cast Solitude and then kill Teferi with the Goblin Shaman. 
Um, but Jake might conclude that he he needs something to go right for him in this game. And oh no, okay, so he's passing, which normally would indicate casting subtlety and instant speed. But actually, the only play he can make now is to touch the spirit realm and and blink the uh, the goblin shaman token. Ooh, it looks like Luna found a soul guide lantern, which is the one graveyard hate piece that you can use while under a Teferi time raveler. That's got to be a sight for sore eyes for her. Yeah, so Jake can prismatic ending a potential soul guide lantern, but that would probably uh, result in Luna, you know, exiling the Atraxa, and Jake would have to set up from scratch. So now he's he's pretty far from being able to assemble his combo or, or do anything um, impressive. Right. And Luna being a turn ahead on the Teferi Time Raveler as well is not nothing because there is a degree where she can do some of the tricksy stuff, bouncing her own fable, for example, just to make another goblin and get another rummage towards her important cards. Or even just clear the Phantom Monster mode of subtlety for her upcoming reflection of Kiki Jiki to take out Teferi. Wow, so great oh. setup for Luna. You know, high high protection, multiple lines of defense with Teferi and Soul Guide Lantern. And then next turn, can just go for the combo. Alter, Lamplight, and even though Jake has some reactive cards of his own, they're going to be ineffective in the face of Teferi. Yeah, this looks like a spot where Jake has to know that he needs to prismatic ending this Teferi Time Raveler, or the game will end on the spot. Oh, oh, he's doing it. Is it going to be on the Fable or the Teferi? It's on the Teferi. Yeah, so oh. now there's a way, right? If Luna goes for the combo and, and, and Jake surprises with Surgical Extraction, then we've got a game. Right, this is exactly what we were talking about before, having these high leverage individual interaction pieces. All right, Leyline Binding goes after Teferi. Altar of Dementia hits the battlefield. Lamplight Phoenix hitting the stack. Oh, I wonder if there's a world where you're supposed to let Luna deck herself. Huh. Okay, Jake's not going to give her the chance, says, nope, absolutely not. I'm not taking the risk. Fires off the surgical in the lamplight. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, that was like, always one of the things against Hogak was you just let them run out of cards, and then, assuming you can do something from there, then you hit the bridges. Yeah, so so it's not that not necessarily that Luna would have to just throw caution to the wind and and uh, deplete her entire library right away, but. In addition to milling herself, Jake could let her start milling him, which might actually be to his benefit if he's able to get a creature into the graveyard. I don't know. There's a lot going on, and there is the Soul Guide Lantern. Um, so I guess I can't bl blame Jake for just getting those phoenixes out of there as soon as possible. But that's that's certainly an interesting spot, especially if you you know iterate the game a few times under some slightly different conditions. I wonder what the best play would be. Also, Jake's at five lands and has a seven mana Atraxa in hand and has the hedge maze on the table. Sure. So it, you're saying against a soul guide lantern on the battlefield, maybe you, you pivot and take a different approach yeah. to the game. And this is Jake's in the good position right now that every magic player loves to be in where spells are good and lands are not that bad. Yep. You just have a lot of good draws at this point. Force of negation, not the best draw here. I, I will that one's on me. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you got the subtlety, you've got the force, little little something for everybody. Yeah, sure, sure. All right, we see Jake going ahead and just firing off subtlety on this solitude just to be a little bit more mana efficient. Uh 
Solitude subtlety, or excuse me, Solitude plus Reflection, also really hard for a creature deck to break out of. Which, I don't know if calling Jinx deck a creature deck is the most fair. It does indeed have creatures. <laughs> but it can't win without dealing combat damage. Looks like that was upkeep cast solitude. Sure. All right, tainted indulgence, probably drawing two. Corio's vengeance and a flooded strand, not bad. So now, if Jake can draw a land, he could hard cast a Traxa. Probably not the best into solitude. There's a lot of stuff that Jake actually just needs to answer here, which is really tough. How close are we to lethal? Like, cast eagles, get the trigger, copy eagles, make a haste thing. Ooh. I think it's not this turn, but but in, within two turns, uh, Luna's going to be able to deal a lot of damage. It's not that far off. This is 11 or something? Yeah, this is 11. Okay, so Bulls now Jake north. really wants to find a way to deal with Soul Guide Lantern off the top, like a prismatic ending lets him combo. Um, but he but, also needs to get the Atraxa in the graveyard, right? Or does he have something? Ready oh, to go? I thought I know. I, I, you're totally correct. I missed that there is not an Atraxa in the graveyard right now, or a Gristlebrand. All right, we have the instep fetch. Well, Ooh. not what I meant by needs the gristle brand. And Jake packs him in. That is Luna moving to the winner's side of week five in the winner's bracket of Mitgo Masters. She is one win away from top eight with, I, you know, I, I'm prepared to say it, the coolest deck.